Welcome signal processing lovers. Uh, hope you're fine, doing well, not getting horribly bored of this um, format. Uh, today we're gonna start discussing filters, uh, which is a huge chapter. Essentially we're gonna scratch the surface, however we're gonna scratch it from multiple perspectives, which is hopefully useful. And uh, there's tons to cover, so I'll get straight to it. Uh, we're gonna first look at the signal processing aspects, look at a few numbers like that. Uh, and we're gonna first discuss essentially signal filters. Um, and then I will uh, broaden the discussion as well. So in terms of signals, uh, they could be analog electronic signals or uh, digital electronic signals. Um, and, and the principles there are quite similar. Evidently with electronics, uh, you're using electric components uh, with uh, digital signals. We're using a certain set of mathematical operations to filter. So the question is, what does it do? Well, it attenuates typically certain frequency regions. Uh, it can ring as well, filters can ring, so they can actually alter the time um, as well. In that, if you ping a filter, you give it a little click, it might actually give you a fairly long signal uh, as a response. Um, so we'll discuss that in more detail. Um, the interesting thing is, potentially unexpected, uh, or not necessarily intuitive, that the way we uh, get to change anything about the frequency spectrum of a signal will have to do with introducing delays, mixing the delayed signals in with the original one. Um, and that is the big chapter of uh, uh, basic filtering. However, there are other ways as well, slightly more advanced. You can actually produce filters through spectral analysis and spectral resynthesis. So you can be more precise in certain ways. You can produce brick wall filters, minimum phase filters, and other more advanced concepts that I mentioned just if you're interested, you might want to look them up. So brief recollection of the delays here. Fairly straightforward. So if we have a signal, digital signal, uh, consists of multiple values, in this case even further simplified to just integer values, uh, you see what the delay actually does. It reproduces the exact same signal, but the values are shifted in time. So if you do that, the spectral content is unaltered. It will have the exact same spectral characteristic. Uh, now, if you take a delayed signal and add it to the original one, then things start getting a bit more complex. So what we see in this case is a fairly straightforward echo type repetition. Obviously, that's an echo for the eye because we see the pattern repeat. In audio domain, this amount of delay, what is this, four or five samples, wouldn't be sufficient for us to hear the repeated signal. And that's exactly where we're going to be finding the, the filtering operations. They're essentially echoes, more or less, but they're so short that they actually alter the spectral content. So what we will have as a general rule is that if we alter the signal using very extremely short delay times, we are altering the frequency content, the spectrum of it. If we grow it a bit, let's call it medium delay times, then we are likely altering the spatial impression of the signal. And then if we push it further, we actually have, um, what should it be? a few hundred milliseconds, well, already hundred milliseconds in, in certain situation, you can actually hear the repetition of the signal. So we're actually dealing with delays, but in a very short time scale, 
which will give these two radically different uh, changes. Obviously, technically, it's a continuum, but we won't go that deep. And also, we won't really discuss the spatial character, how we can alter that, but actually deal with the shortest delay times. We're going to deal with filtering. Um, so things can get complex when we sum delayed signals with the original signals. In fact, that's what happens in space as well, right? So if I speak to the microphone here, there is a reflection of the side wall, which will take longer time to reach the microphone. And at the position of the microphone, these two signals are essentially summed together. So that's something that happens in nature as well. In this very case, the, the delay of the reflection is sufficient for it to create a slightly more complex response. We will get something that is called a COM filter, which you will study in more detail on Friday, I believe. Uh, and here's an example of that. So we have a source, we have a copy. And uh, the point to make here is that when we say summing, we actually include subtraction, because summing with an inverse phase signal is the subtraction. So typically in, in signal processing, uh, subtraction is not used as a concept. Instead, we use summing with inverted phase. Similarly to the way that we don't really use uh, division very often, most likely you will encounter multiplication with the reciprocal value. Um, so that's the general sense of what you can expect from math in signal processing. So let's look at what could happen if things get more complex. So here we have a summing without the delay. And what you see is that we double the amplitude, which is otherwise called constructive interference. And then you see what happens if we subtract the copy from the source, we cancel out all the values, all the values are zero, and this is destructive interference. So if I add a signal with an inverted version of the same signal, in other words, if I subtract the signal from itself, there is nothing left. Uh, so therefore, what we have is the situation whereby we can actually double the amplitude of a signal, but we can also totally remove the signal. And this is the situation when, when we don't even have a delay in this recombination. And as soon as we introduce delay, we will actually have similar things happening in terms of increasing gain, decreasing gain, but we will also have a frequency characteristic. Okay, so the, the reason is that if you have a, a signal, let's say, the, that has a period of four samples, okay, so it repeats every four samples, right? And if you have a signal that has a period of six samples, right, and you delay it by four samples and invert it, add it to the original, right, then all the content that was periodic across the four samples will be removed. But the content that was periodic over six samples will not be fully removed. There will be some effect in terms of how the gain changes but it will be a different amount of attenuation. Okay, so hopefully this gives you an idea how once you delay a signal, you actually what you're doing is that different frequencies are delayed by a different amount of phase offset. Okay, so here comes the difference, which is crucial between the phase offset and the delay. So if I talk about phase offset, I'm actually linking the delay to the frequency. Right, so if I, let's say I offset the phase by pi or 180 degrees, 
right? That would typically be your inversion phase, phase inversion. If I offset a four sample period signal by half period, that's two samples. But if I phase offset a six sample period signal by a half period, then that's three samples. So you see a phase offset is a frequency related delay. So what happens then is if I have a fixed time delay of a complex signal, then every frequency will be offset by a different phase amount. And therefore, where I start adding it back to itself, then different frequencies will cancel each other out in different ways, different amounts, or just attenuate, or indeed increase the gain. Okay, so that's the basic functioning principle, the, the thing to kind of intuitively grasp. Why does delay, why does summing the signal with its delayed version cause different frequency uh, anomalies or anomalies in different frequency ranges, different anomalies. Okay, so here is a demonstration of a very basic set of signals, numbers. So we have a source, we have a copy in red. And in this case, what you see is that the first hump has survived. And that's obviously because we've defined the signal as starting at zero and uh, delayed that. But in fact, if you consider this a uh, continuous periodic signal, then the first hump wouldn't survive either. So that's your basic destructive interference right there. Okay, now, we thus understand that delaying by different amounts, adding back to the original will produce filtering. And on top of that, uh, in order to get to structures that are actually useful as filters, what we typically need, we need to change the gain of these delayed versions. So here's an example, a basic signal, we multiplied by half. And that's what we get. So once we add these two things in, we have a delay and we have a multiplier, what we typically call a coefficient, then we starting to get to this basic structure of filters in a signal processing. This, by the way, is called a difference equation. So the bottom equation there, what you can read is the, the yt, so the output at time t, will be the minus 0.3 times the input, x is always the input at time t, plus minus 0.5, the input, the x at two samples before t minus 2. Okay, so here you see a combination of uh, an original, the input signal, that's the xt, and the delayed signal, that's the xt minus 2, they're being summed together, and they have different multipliers. And this structure already will actually allow you to produce quite a few different filters. It's worth saying that pro uh, calculating the frequency characteristic of such an equation is moderately difficult. But what's even more difficult is having a frequency response target and then calculate the, the, the filter coefficients. And this is a domain of engineering called filter design, which is rather complex. No way we'll, we'll get there. But understanding the basis, the, 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 uh, the building blocks of filters is, is really crucial because we encounter these blocks elsewhere and it's important that we uh, intuitively grasp what the effect may be, what it is likely to be. Okay, so here it is, a difference equation, which is a bit more complex. So we have the original signal, and we have four delayed versions. Each one is delayed by a further sample. And this is typically what you would call a fourth order filter. So the amount of uh, previous samples that you take into account, that you use in order to um, calculate your uh, final signal, will be the order of the filter and will actually specify how precise or how steep the frequency response of the filter will be. Maybe you 
have heard of uh, speaker crossovers. So now back to the electric variant of the filter. It's a similar thing. The amount of components, which are typically capacitors and coils, will determine the order of the filter and thereby will determine the slope. Uh, so the, the degree to which uh, the attenuation kicks in. We'll talk about this in a second. Okay, so essentially, if we have these coefficients fixed, we have this delay network, a lot of delays, a summing uh, mixer at the end, uh, then no matter when we send the signal into this network, it will do the same thing. It will have the same frequency response, the same phase response, and we therefore conclude that it is time invariant, if you remember from week three. Furthermore, because every increase at the input will yield a proportional increase uh, at the output, this is a linear system. So filters are linear time invariant systems. So what we've looked at so far is adding previous signals, uh, sorry, adding delayed signals to the current signals or previous samples to current samples. Um, and that's half of the story. The other half of the story is that we are adding the previous output samples. So we can actually create a feedback loop around these tiny delays. And then we get feedback delay networks, or in the terms of filtering, we get IIRs, infinite impulse response filters. So the thing to note there is if you see such an equation, is that, again, Y is the output, so YT is the current output sample, and in this case, it equals the current input sample, the XT plus the YT minus two. So two uh, the, the output delayed by two samples. So the second previous output sample, um, which indeed can be depicted, you will see a sketch of this as a feedback, which means that things can blow up uh, if the gain coefficient is such. Um, okay, uh, here's a bit more reading about the DSP side of things. Um, very exciting, potentially. But let's now turn the discussion uh, to consider another perspective, slightly more practical, and consider the fact that we have filtering in our acoustic environment happening all the time. So what I've just mentioned is the reflection of a wall, which causes COM filtering. But actually, we can also consider how different materials will filter the sound differently by attenuating different frequencies with different levels. Uh, we can consider that the shape of materials can actually have a significant impact on different frequency re re uh, ranges. And uh, in terms of projection, right, if you think of mutes or modifying the, the instruments, uh, Essentially, every physical uh, modification of a resonating system will change the way it resonates. Um, and every system resonates to a certain extent. So what you can consider is that everything is a filter. I mean, uh, this little booklet here, I mean, it, it, it can be um, a projection related filter. So if I'm talking into the microphone and I put this in front of my mouth, right? it is likely that the high frequencies are attenuated. <clears throat> I can also use it as a physical filter, right? So not just the propagation of sound in air, but I can actually uh, shake it. I can put a, a, an, um, a transducer on it, use it as a speaker, which would again, in a way, filter the signal. Certain frequencies will propagate, will come through the system easier than others. So. It, it is worth worth opening up the understanding of, of how filters um, actually surround us constantly. Um, okay, so uh, a lot of uh, 
resonators in acoustic instruments you can actually call filters okay so as i mentioned also an electronic filter can ping right so if you deliver an impulse it can actually ring on and this still allows it to be linear time invariant system by the way because if you deliver the ping at a different time it will do the same thing uh, so if you consider any kind of resonator I don't have wine bottles here but uh, if I had and I blew a wine bottle you can actually consider that a filter as well because what I'm delivering if I blow against the neck of the wine bottle what I actually delivering is a broadband signal a noisy uh, broadband signal and when I get is actually a very specific frequency so I've kind of filter out um, a lot of different frequencies and the energy in those different frequencies has focused into the resonance frequency so it is also worth adding how uh, in order to be precise you shouldn't say that a passive system amplifies stuff okay so even though if I blow like this compared to blowing into the wine bottle I you will hear a louder sound from a perspective you know layman's position you would say well it am amplifies my blowing but if you consider the bottle it's a passive system there is no way it will introduce more energy into the environment so it is just shaping that energy so uh, typically acoustical filtering when we talk about this we're considering passive systems that change the frequency spectrum like that um, okay uh, human voice production is a really interesting example of variable filtering so the case is that my vocal folds actually produce a buzz with the changing pitch and the whole detail the whole articulation uh, that I manage when I speak has to do with uh, filtering through the uh, through the cavities essentially so nasal cavity and and also my mouth as a cavity they will change the frequency content uh, so evidently if I talk with my nose shut you hear that there is a notch filter essentially some frequencies are excluded uh, some frequencies don't resonate the way they normally do and if I change the shape of my mouth I can't quite readily shape I can probably change the shape of my nose a bit as well I'll avoid trying that right now but very obviously if I produce a fixed pitch I can produce all the vowel sounds essentially just by changing the shape of my mouth which is a filtering process and it will have multiple peaks that we call um, formants so you can study that uh, if you're interested but we'll just get on with uh, the filtering um, okay a um, few terms that you might want to make sure you, you uh, use appropriately and indeed understand well once you read them um, are damping muting and resonance I'll let you uh, attend to these uh, so here are here is the example of uh, a magnitude spectrum which is the accurate term for this spectral display uh, where we see the frequency content of a signal typically you would have amplitude or magnitude uh, displayed vertically and you would have the frequency displayed horizontally with frequencies increasing to the right uh, and this is a spectrum of a trumpet tone where you see how harmonics are very clear and how they actually have a different uh, amplitude and you can actually trace the peaks to find what we call the spectral envelope okay so other than time related envelopes which you probably are aware of we also have the term spectral envelope which has to do with the overall shape of the spectrum 
And what you will find, well, Trumpet is not a great example here because uh, there is not much uh, in terms of uh, a resonator added to the to the instrument because it's essentially one big excitation mechanism. You could say that the length of the tubing is a resonator, uh, but in fact, what I'm getting at is that the resonator is variable and is part of the excitation system compared to a guitar, for example, which has a body, an acoustic guitar, which is fixed. It doesn't change with the pitch of the sound. So what I'm getting at here is that if you have a fixed resonator, it will actually impose a very similar spectral envelope on the excitation signal. So, in fact, you would have the same spectral envelope with the, with the harmonics kind of moving underneath when the pitch changes, which is slightly different uh, for a trumpet here. However, you see that there is a lot of detail in terms of how different uh, harmonics uh, appear. Now, the other thing to note is that this is a linear frequency plot we also may encounter uh, a logarithmic one. On the linear frequency plot, you will see that the harmonics are evenly spaced. Okay, so the distance between each harmonic is the same. If you have a, which is actually giving you a sense of distance of harmonics, which is different from how we hear it, uh, because we hear near logarithmically especially at the mid and high frequencies. So what you will have is that on a logarithmic plot, these the higher harmonics will be more densely spaced and therefore uh, a slightly different plot worth, worth noting or, or um, paying attention to this. So this is the original trumpet spectrum and this is with the cup mute. So you see there is more detail introduced already in the mid frequencies there is an overall decrease of the high frequency content. So it's actually a complex filter if you put a mute on the trumpet. And that's what it does. Uh, here is a bucket mute. You can look these up. Maybe you're a trumpet player yourself. Indeed, what you see is that it actually filters much more. Okay, uh, so further ways to define what filtering is i believe i believe we've been through uh, these things one of the additional things to note is that this principle of filtering is not only valid and useful in the audio domain if you're dealing with sensor data control domain filtering stuff works as well and it is not the intuitive understanding of filtering, like removing certain things that we perceive as such. But actually what you get to is to remove the slower movements or you remove the faster movements, uh, which actually has to do with low frequency and high frequency, right? So a low frequency audio signal is a much slower movement and the high frequencies, a faster movement. So we're actually balancing these, balancing the magnitude of these movements. So with sensor data, for example, if you have a lot of uh, high frequency uh, noise, for example, you can actually take a low pass filter and you will make the signal much smoother. Okay. Uh, another uh, situation, you might have a sensor which is, for example, uh, sensitive to the position, but you're not interested in the absolute offset, whether I'm moving, you know, in the left bit or in the right bit, but I'm just interested in the movement itself, the faster movement compared to the offset or the slow movement, indeed, like traversing in the range of the sensor, then you can use a high pass filter and it will, it will actually remove the absolute offset of the signal, right? which goes back to the DC offset, which is a zero hertz frequency component. Uh, so you can imagine that if I'm removing low frequencies, I'm also removing the lowest, the zero hertz, the DC offset. So actually, once you, once you get a grip uh, and, and understand how filtering does what it does 
you should be able to extrapolate that understanding and um, project, uh, discover what these systems might do for different types of signals, not necessarily audio signals. Uh, good, so frequency response, I've introduced this graph just now, otherwise called magnitude response, spectral response, all these terms cover this type of plot. And here's a very simple version. We have a gain stage just multiplying the signal with a fixed value. And what you get is that there is no spectral detail in the response. <clears throat> but there is just the offset so the gain is changing so practically again stage will not perform filtering now once you get to a system that does filter you can look at the effect in frequency domain which is the top part so we have a few frequency components we have a, f a filter which is here expressed uh, using uh, magnitude response of the filter so you see that 500 Hertz is passed through. It's a bound pass filter. The lower frequencies are attenuated. The higher frequencies are attenuated. And then you can figure out what will be the result if you send in this signal that has three spectral components. And you can also look at the time domain, in which case it is not quite apparent what has happened to the signal. You see that the waveform has changed. But if you really pay good attention you will see that the 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 balance of the uh, faster and slower fluctuations has changed okay typically what is very obvious is that the fastest fluctuation the highest frequency the one kilohertz here is actually gone down in amplitude I mean the whole signal has gone down in amplitude a bit you see as well but especially this ratio between the slow movement and the high movement on top has changed. And it also shows you how it is difficult to appreciate what has happened to the signal if you look at the uh, waveform. Therefore, we look at the spectrum most often. Okay, so let's discuss the most basic uh, filters here. Uh, you might have studied this uh, with synthesis, but I understand it should be worthwhile uh, repeating some of this stuff. Low pass filter, LPF, what we have is low frequency passes, high frequencies are attenuated. We have this one cutoff frequency, which specifies where the filter starts taking effect. This cutoff frequency is specified as minus 3 dB point because the filter starts to roll off very gently so it's really difficult to say where it starts to take effect but it therefore we have a way of saying where it starts to take noticeable effect which is this 3 dB point so the filter starts very gently but where it reaches the minus 3 dB attenuation that frequency is called the cutoff frequency um, so what we have then is a plot of the ideal filter. Typically the terms that we use here are passband. This is the band of frequencies that is unaltered. We have the transition band where frequencies are progressively more attenuated. And then we would have the stop band where there is nothing coming through. However, in, in practice, what you will find is that there is always a bit left so to speak so we can do the math there and figure out how much is left uh, so typically we're always in a kind of a transition band um, you will also find authors considering this transition band the stop band so the transition band is a bit of a uh, a term that is not very frequently used what you will often encounter is stop band and pass band uh, one next to each other. Here is a generic block diagram figure uh, that may represent a filter, a low pass filter. So again, input to output, uh, one input for the parameter, which is the cutoff frequency. Uh, this is the kind of block uh, that I will be using in displaying certain 
more complex processing schemes. Okay, so here is a sketch of how this filter then uh, affects two different signals. In fact, what you see is that if you input a flat uh, signal in the sense that the spectral, the magnitudes uh, are equal, it has all the frequencies at the same level, then what you get is the spectral response of the filter. So that in a way is a way of testing it. Uh, so white noise is one such signal that has a flat spectrum. Uh, an impulse is another such signal that has a flat spectrum. So that's where we get into the impulse response, which you have encountered before, which will uh, uh, have the ability to define filters as well as spaces, a fairly crucial engineering term. Uh, and then what you see is that if you input a different signal, obviously you get a different result. But in a way, if you know the spectral response of the filter, you can derive the result of any input using that spectral response. Okay, so let's get into uh, building processing schemes with basic filters. So here is your low frequency base boost effect. Um, typically, the basic filters will be the low pass, the high pass, the notch, uh, and the band pass. Uh, so what you have is that if you want this base boost type effect, you actually have to combine the low signal and add it back to the original signal. And this is what you see here. So you have two paths. You have the dry path, the bottom one. And to this you add a low pass version of the signal. So you have a cutoff frequency control that controls the filter and you have the gain which controls the amount of base boost effect. Okay, it's a valuable exercise. Uh, code it in PD. If you have the time, it's, it's really worth uh, just making sure that these basic schemes translate to PD code under your command very easily. So not sketch the code, but code it. Um, okay, and then the high pass filter. So the other way around, not much more to say. Uh, similar things, cutoff frequency, stop band, pass band, a little uh, block scheme. Now the band pass filter is a special one. It might be defined with two cutoff frequencies, uh, but it might also be defined by the center frequency and the bandwidth. Okay, so uh, it might be constructed from a low pass and a high pass filter but it also might be a resonant filter, which is technically not the same, but kind of goes under the same hood. Uh, so slightly more complex, but essentially fairly easy to understand from the previous ones. Now with the band pass filter, we actually start to get into the ringing. The band pass filters are the ones that will ring more. By the way, low pass and high pass can ring as well. It depends on the order of the filter, uh, which has to do with the steepness of the stop band or the transition band, if I was uh, more accurate. But with band pass filter, what we have is typically the Q or the resonance control. Um, so increasing Q will essentially decrease the bandwidth and make the filter ring more. Okay, so you see the equation here, the Q factor is actually the center frequency over the bandwidth, which means that the higher the frequency, right, the higher the bandwidth has to be. So it is kind of compensating for the logarithmic property of um, how we hear frequencies which means that if you have the same Q factor across different frequencies, it will pretty much ring as much. Whereas if you have a different bandwidth, you see if I have a 50 Hertz bandwidth around 100 Hertz, that's much more than having a 50 Hertz bandwidth around 2K, 
Okay, so the bandwidth itself, if it's expressed as a difference of the higher cutoff and the lower cutoff, is actually somewhat deceiving in terms of how much ringing you can expect. Okay, so the narrower the filter, the more ringing, the higher the peak in the, in the spectral response. Uh, okay, so that's your Q value. You've probably encountered it before. Uh, getting on with further filter arrangements, this is the one that we've actually seen and built in, um, in a practical. Uh, so you have a filter bank. Now, what we've done in the practical is slightly different because we've actually made a crossover filter. We've actually made sure that all the frequencies are passed through either of the three possible bands. Here what you have is a filter bank where everything seems to have a separate control. So you can actually mess up the resulting spectrum. It doesn't retain necessarily all the frequencies. Um, but it can be slightly more useful. Typically when you have all these parameters available, the frequency, the Q factor, and the gain, evidently, then you call this a full parametric uh, filter or EQ. Um, parametric would be with just the frequency, um, although depending on the source, this may vary. Okay, so the opposite of the band pass is the band reject or notch filter. Nothing much to add here, typically what you would expect based on your current understanding. So here is the combination of low pass and high pass in series. What you expect if the frequencies are spaced such, there may be a full pass band between the two filters. Evidently, if the cutoffs are arranged inversely, then you might not end up with no signal at all because they come in series. What one filter filters out, the other one doesn't have available already. Okay, so in combination, they may actually filter out everything. And it's useful to see how this will be different from putting such filters in parallel. Okay, uh, which is this arrangement here. Just consider this, I believe it is straightforward and intuitive. Okay, so now we've went into the more practical aspects of filtering, seeing what types we have available in terms of the basic filters. <clears throat> in the practical, I spent some time actually um, saying things about uh, shelving filters, which are typically built out of these basic low pass, high pass type filters. So let's go back now a bit to the to the DSP side of things and actually look at how these filters are also expressed in signal processing block diagrams, uh, which is crucial because you've seen how we can actually put a filter, which is kind of a black box filter, does what it does as a part of our processing chain. But that very filter is actually a similar thing in that it is just a processing chain so this kind of encapsulation is very useful because you don't necessarily need to see the insides of the filter. But if you manage to connect these domains, you really go a step further because you start to understand how certain basic arrangement of signal processing blocks may be filters in themselves. Okay, so you can actually have a signal processing diagram, which does not specify where the filter is, but a certain part of it is actually doing the filtering. Or indeed, if you have a certain arrangement of uh, processing blocks, some of which are delays, if you understand this topic well, you will be able to identify where there may be filtering which was unexpected or even unintended. Okay, so here is a block diagram of your most basic filter. So the kind of equations that you've seen before, uh, 
whereby we have the Y, the output signal, the X, the input signal, and then the X with the N minus one or T minus one uh, or minus another value, which uh, signifies the delayed signal. Uh, so in signal processing textbooks, you will often find Z to the power of minus value to denote a delay and the exponent, the minus value, will tell you the amount of samples that the signal is delayed by. So very often you may in, uh, um, encounter this Z to the power minus one, which is a single sample delay. And by the way, the basic low pass filters, the first order low pass filters, high pass filters are all built with this single sample delay. So this is a network where we are essentially adding the previous sample to the current one, nothing else. In this case, I don't even have gains for the different signals. We're just adding the previous value to the current one, the previous sample to the current one. And what we get, believe it or not, is actually we already get a low pass filter. So with this situation, you will actually be filtering out the higher frequencies. Why is that? Well, you can kind of think of it if the frequency is really high, this very small amount of delay may already introduce destructive interference. For a low frequency, this very small amount of delay and evidently adding the delay signal to the original will not really do anything because the signal takes much longer to actually go positive and negative, right? So it will never significantly alter the signal, this amount of delay. For a very fast signal, in fact, if you consider the signal which is at Nyquist frequency, right? Which means that one sample is up, the other one is down, up, down, the highest possible representable signal in this digital context then you understand that actually one sample delay is already half the period. So if I do this with the Nyquist frequency signal, I actually get full destructive interference. It will actually cancel itself out completely, right? So you actually know that this filter, when you add the previous sample to the current one, will have uh, attenuated, cancelled out, the Nyquist frequency and as the frequency becomes lower the cancellation will become lesser okay so in order to make this an actual filter that you may encounter uh, the only thing to add are coefficients okay so the gain factors for the two uh, bits and typically what you will have is that they are inverse of one one is the inverse of the other so in that way, it is made sure that the energy, the input energy is the same as the output energy. You see, if you had signal doubled and added to itself, you're essentially doubling the energy. If you uh, don't consider the spectral characteristic there. Uh, and if you do this, if you make sure that the, the balance of the two signals is such that I always have a multiplier of one in total, then you're kind of preserving the energy because this filter, it is a filter, it is a low pass filter, but it will actually dramatically increase the gain of very low frequencies because you're essentially doubling the signal at low frequencies. So once you uh, add in the gains here, you're actually looking at a generic finite impulse response filter. Okay, this is your FIR. So the equation is very similar to the previous one, added in the A coefficient. Uh, so what is it? Uh, it's the most basic filter with the feed forward path. Okay, uh, the slope will be 6 dB per octave. So that is the steepness of the filter. And if you increase the order of the filter, the slope increases as well. So in fact, if you think about this over five octaves, right, you will get 30 dB attenuation. Five octaves is a lot and 30 dB isn't that much. I mean, it is definitely audible. It is truly attenuated at 30 dB, but it is not removed. 
okay so that's the thing to note that lower order filters do not remove frequencies they attenuate them okay uh, the thing that we didn't talk much about in terms of the result signal is the phase of the result so we understand that altering the phase is what happens inside the filter and using this we get these cancellations but actually the resultant signal will also have phases altered in relation to the input signal so this is where things get a bit more complex we we'll probably won't dig into this but it's useful to to remember because these phase changes may affect the transparency of the transients and they may affect the spatial impression uh, as well uh, in certain situations you will not hear any difference when the phase is altered of the sound it's a it's a more complex topic we might get to later or in the practical indeed if you're interested just ask away and i'm happy to uh, to elaborate uh, Okay, uh, here is a phase response of a low pass filter, just so you see. Um, so what we have is typically that at the cutoff frequency, we the phase is preserved, okay? And then what we get is that uh, you get different phase response for different frequencies. We won't go into much detail here. Okay, so the other counter part here is the feedback version of what we've just seen. So again, a single sample delay, two gain coefficients, but a feedback path. Okay, so this is where the Y appears on the right hand side of the equation. So I'm looking at the current input sample and some of the previous output samples. And here you see how that actually draws up a feedback path. So this filter can be more unstable uh, because it can blow up, right? If the gain in the feedback path is too large, it might go uh, and explode. Uh, so the impulse response of these filters is something that really defines them quite well. Uh, we don't quite have the time and the scope to go into this, but it is interesting to see, in fact, you can derive an impulse response of such a network by sending in a signal which is the impulse which is start with one and then all the rest are all the rest of the values are zero so what you will see with this network is that it has an infinite impulse response uh, which means that if you send in a one it will keep feeding back it might reduce in amplitude so it might decay away but unless you multiply with a zero, you always get a, a non-zero result from multiplication. So theoretically, it will never die out. In a digital system with a finite bit depth, you will get a number which is sufficiently small to be uh, truncated to zero. But theoretically, such a feedback network will have an infinite impulse response. It will never go to zero. Okay, that's why we call it that. Uh, and you can figure that out. I mean, in fact, you will get this exponential decay from this type of network. Whereas with the finite impulse response filter, the one here, what you will have in the impulse response, you'll have the original uh, value come through. And then the next sample will be likely attenuated version of that original value and then it's dead already then it's just zeros okay so this kind of impulse response understanding um, is something i invite you to research okay uh, here's an impulse you can actually uh, work it into your filters and uh, see what happens uh, so to round it off, uh, we've talked about these basic filters, which work typically with a single sample delay. Uh, 
we didn't quite discuss the biquad filter, which is a second order filter. Uh, and then you will study also the comp filters, which could have a very similarly simple scheme where you have a delayed signal and the original signal, but what you will have is a longer delay time. Uh, so you will study that. Then resonant filters, I mean, essentially what you have is the opportunity to design a whole lot of different uh, filtering uh, structures. This kind of single sample delay based one is the starting point and probably uh, sufficient for our uh, research into the signal processing and uh, hopefully allows us to know what to expect from certain effects uh, altogether. Now we would have a set of filtering effects. Now we're talking about uh, more complex structures whereby you would be changing the parameters. Okay, so you would have a kind of a wah-wah when the filter cutoff changes, things that are called auto filters, similar things. Uh, in which case you might actually be using the amplitude of the input signal to change the cutoff frequency. And this actually opens up a whole can of worms, a really exciting set of things you might want to explore and study, which are called adaptive effects. So typically you have a class of effects which are fairly static, you tune the parameters, or indeed you add modulators to control the parameters. And then we have a class of effects which are called adaptive, whereby some of the parameters are controlled by a certain analysis of the input signal. So it is an automated structure. You don't really have to uh, change any uh, sliders or knobs, uh, but it does change in a funny way with the signal. So I think auto is also this uh, one of the names to cover this where a louder input signal will open the filter more. So the amplitude of the input signal controls a certain parameter of the processing of that signal. And evidently the amplitude there is the you know point of departure, it's the easiest thing. But we actually have a set of spectral uh, analyses which can be quite useful. We can actually extract things like brightness, spectral centroid, um, what else? Uh, spectral flux. There is about five or ten of these uh, which describe a certain aspect of the signal, uh, give you a single value, give you one other signal that describes the input audio signal. And then you can use this property of the signal to control a certain processing parameter. So what you get is a way of creating really interesting and complex effects Okay, and then we also have filters that actually don't change the magnitude spectrum. They don't attenuate frequency, but they just change the phase of the signal, which is another interesting uh, set of filters. These are called all pass filters, very useful in reverb type effects and similar. Excellent. I thank you for your attention and I shall see you shortly. Goodbye.